I'm pleased to introduce Brian Hookstein. Brian is an associate professor of marketing at the University of Alabama. Prior to his current role, he was a sales executive with Time Warner Media. Dr. H is considered an academic thought leader on customer success management and sales topics. As such, he regularly facilitates academic and industry discussions via thought leadership forums, industry conferences, and research interviews. Dr. H's research appears in numerous journals, and he, and he also teaches in and leads the University of Alabama's master level sales leadership program. Additionally, he facilitates doctoral seminars and professional development courses. He is an author of the textbook, Marketing Strategy. And as I mentioned before, he's also authoring a student course where that will include 12 chapters and a simulation on sales management. Dr. H and his family reside in Northport, Alabama, where they enjoy community, church, and university service opportunities. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. It's uh, great to be with you today. Yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to you. When you finish, yeah. I'll hop on and we'll do live Q&A. Excellent, let me get my screen sharing here. Okay, so thank you for joining today. Um, the topic we're talking about today is the specialized sales roles, preparing your students to compete in the job market. It's a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, anybody that knows me uh, realizes for the last like six years, I've been really involved in this idea of that there's more than one type of sales role. So we'll talk about that a little bit today. So let me get this advancing here properly. There we go. So today, quick agenda. What is a sales job? What are sales jobs? And how can I prepare my students is what I plan to talk about. We'll see how those go um, and how those simple titles can mean a lot of different things. But the first question is, what is a sales job? And I think I have a poll ready to go here. Give me one second. Um, and I would like everybody to take a look at this. Okay. I'm going to go with this first question of, we teach, I'm going to share it now, we have a poll. We teach that sales, a sales job is performed by a full cycle salesperson, a hunter, farmer, or something else. I'm just curious in our audience of, of uh, sales educators, kind of what we're telling our students um, and, and how we're characterizing the marketplace of where they're going to go work. So it'll be interesting to see what we have here. I have my suspicions, um, but I don't know what's going on in every sales program across the country and the world. So it'll be interesting to hear what we, what we see. A lot of room for um, different answers and something else. Um, we'll talk about a variety of those things today. So give it maybe 30 seconds more. Well, the good news is many are teaching more than a majority are at the moment on a small sample are teaching um, something else. Okay. So, um, full cycle sales is about 29%, hunter farmer 14, 57 for something else. I think we'll be good with that for right now. Let me go back to here. All right. So what is a sales job? And, and I alluded to in that poll is, is what I'm getting at here is the idea that, you know, we have this sales process, right? I think we all teach some kind of sales process and, and I'll grant you it's not a linear thing as this shows. This is a somewhat updated version that comes from a paper I published in the Journal of Service Research, um, kind of bringing together some, some different literatures and different, um, tool, different uh, sources and saying that somewhere between understanding what the, cus the customer yeah, and, and approaching them leads to them possibly buying something from us. If they do, we then will take some actions to maintain that client and continue to sell to them. So that's, that's what this says here. We don't need to go through each individual step right now. I'm not teaching that today, but we could all agree there's some steps that happen. They, they don't always go in this order exactly, but um, most, most sales processes follow these kind of steps. And really for most of time, I worked in, for Time Warner, as Paul mentioned, and um, I was this guy that did all of this. Like I was for 10 years in Northern Wisconsin, I was the guy that did every step of this and kept it going across all different clients. Um, it's a difficult kind of thing to do, right? It's, 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 it's not easy. So many companies are changing how they do that because of the difficulty, but full cycle salesperson is part of this process. Um, marketing develops leads, support staff to process and facilitate sales activity, perhaps, and maybe some specialized teams formed when you have a particularly complex thing going on. 
um, or your customer needs some some engineering or something involved. So that that may be happening, right? And, and I think a lot of our, our our sales programs hopefully aren't teaching only this. There's not a terrible problem in teaching only this other than it leaves a lot out. The student still learns about all the different steps and they can apply that knowledge later, but it's, it's, it's a good starting point. Um, and, and I'll talk about how it fits with different classes as we go forward. But um, I don't think it says everything we should be teaching. So if you're only teaching this, um, you're probably missing some stuff. So then I say, what is a sales job with a little S after it? And I think many, I thought it'd be more would be on the, the um, full cycle or, or hunter farmer. But you may have this kind of thing where the hunters out there, we all acknowledge this, right? That the hunters out there finding leads and developing them and closing business and, and moving on to another new business client um, prospect. And then you have a farmer that's also out there and that farmer is uh, account manager and is spending more time really developing the, the, the customer into a long-term uh, you know, a good customer that over time, finding new ways to upsell, cross-sell, and maintain that, that client. So and pretty much the same kind of situation. I think most programs, most teachers would get into at least this level of specialization. Um, and it's pretty much where I was at when I, when I started teaching. I'm like, there's these hunters and these farmers, and that makes some sense, right? Because they're kind of different actions that are going on there. But, and I say, what are sales jobs? Because honestly, there's, there's a heck of a lot more than that, right, in sales. And I don't know that all of our programs are, are getting so deeply into this topic. And I don't know how deeply we need to get. It kind of depends on your program and what you're, what you're aiming, what your goals are. But we'll go over this just a little bit. So what are sales jobs? If you start looking at all the different jobs in sales, you can still start. Everything really starts with this process, right? All of our CRM systems and everything that is out there in sales has something to do with this process, right? We're always doing motions based on what's going on and where we are in this process with particular clients that we're working with or prospects. But in a more specialized role, now I was at some companies this summer uh, doing some case studies. Um, in fact, one of them was at Stukent in, in Idaho, um, but others too. And, you know, I was very aware of the next one, which I'll talk about is a BDR, which, um, which Donald mentioned as well but uh, the business development rep, but there are roles that are even pre, <laughs> pre BDR. So I think BDR was enough to uh, go out there and find leads, but many companies have a pre-sales role, which is doing all this kind of understanding the customer, trying to figure out the knowledge about the, the uh, industry, about this type of customer, really doing the dive into kind of the background research, which they then hand off to a BDR or SDR or some other term that means business development rep, sales development rep, something like that. Sometimes S means strategic development rep. I've seen all different terminology going around that. But these people probably don't handle all of needs discovery, but they do some basic needs discovery. Um, and, and they will work off if there is a pre-sales. They may do all of that first step too, depending on where you look at this. But they're, they're not really outselling anything other than getting meetings, right? And following leads to a point of getting a, a meeting scheduled for the next person in the process here, which we could call acquisition sales. I kind of like that title um, at a high level because it encompasses many, many things across many, many companies. But the idea we're going out to get business, this would be your hunter. Um, account executive is a term that often goes with this. And I have them kind of overlapping in my chart here if you're following along. Because somewhere in this needs discovery, this, this prospect will move from the BDR, SDR to the actual uh, sales rep, that's the hunter, the sales rep, the account executive, it, not sure where, kind of depends on what makes sense for each product in each company. So now we have three people already, and we haven't even closed a sale yet, three people out there working on, on these sales. We then move into this newer role. If you've talked to me anytime in the last six years, you've heard about it, if we've engaged in any conversation, because I look at the CSM role, customer success manager. Um, this person's job isn't really direct sales, but this person's job is helping the customer to, they've now purchased a product, they've been onboarded, maybe, I don't even have an onboarding specialist in here, but they've maybe been onboarded by onboarding specialist. Um, if not, they've helped to onboard the client. And they're working with this client and helping them to get more value from the product that's been sold. They're not really, depending on the company, they may be doing some retention, renewal kind of stuff, but they're not really out there selling. They don't have a quota they may have some longer term stuff. Everything they're doing is, is geared towards retention and potentially growth, ideally growth, 
but it's over the long term. They're not working on quotas and quarterly budgets and stuff like that. They're working on annual retention, annual growth. They're very much long-term sellers. They don't call themselves sellers, but they do some motions that are very much um, relationship management. And they, they focus that all on data-driven and other indicators of how the customer is using the product and how the customer can use the product better. It started in the SaaS industry, and um, it really relates to the complexity and the changing nature of products these days and how customers just can't figure them out. But yet there's more, so that's one. We also have, in many companies, retention and growth sales. These can be account managers or other titles, and they kind of overlap with the CSM. They'll end up working here, um, coming in and out of the relationship with the customer success manager, um, working to close new sales, being maybe getting a handoff when, when a new product is needed, when uh, some growth opportunities or leads come from customer success management, these, these sales reps will get in place. So right there now we've got one, two, three, four, five, at least five sales roles. Onboarding could be another one maybe. Um, but then we also have inbound marketing, demand generation, many terms, not really a sales role, but that's how we're getting some of these leads. We're out there doing stuff to bring people in into our funnel, right? So kind of related to sales, there's people doing that job. Then we have also supporting and working with and around these salespeople, sales enablement, sales operations, sales support, sales analysts, um, and, and especially in customer success related companies, they're, they're doing a lot with data, but probably in any company, they're doing a lot with data these days and trying to figure out um, how we can better serve our clients, hopefully, as well as how can we continue to grow our, in our sales, right? So there's a whole story we could talk about on this chart right here, but um, you know, it's kind of more complex, right? It's not just one, one full cycle salesperson. I literally did all of this stuff myself with one support staff for 10 years in Northeastern Wisconsin. Um, and it was possible, but in, in most of our industries now, this isn't how it's being done. Um, a hunter farmer model doesn't capture this either. And what's important to note here is really each of these roles has its own personality, its own kind of specific job tasks. They vary based on the role. So it's not like one person can do one and maybe would just jump over to the other. They may learn they could move into that. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go. So I thought I had a cool idea, but I see Donald had this too. I thought I'm going to ask chat GPT because you don't really necessarily have to listen to me. I pretty much use chat GPT in my classes now every, every day that I teach to point out that we can use it as a good tool, but I use it here too. And, um, I just typed in, what are types of sales jobs in SaaS companies? Now, these don't only have to be in software as a service companies. Um, they kind of started there, this idea of this extreme specialization of sales, but they don't only have to be there. Um, we see them all over. Any kind of product that gives us feedback on what's happening with the product is a candidate, and companies are finding they need to help their customers, and they need to add the CSM role, and they, they find there's some efficiencies in adding BDRs, and, and depending on the industry and, and the maturity of the product, they're going to use some of these roles. So it's beyond SaaS, but just to keep it clean for ChatGPT, I found some good answers. So <clears throat> ChatGPT comes up with uh, three here on this page. Account executive, AE, mentioned that, inside sales rep. We could have a whole discussion about inside, outside sales. I'm not going to do that today. That's something we're working on. Uh, enterprise sales rep, which would be the more like um, almost key account manager. Uh, Mid-market sales representative, small and medium business sales representative, sales development res representative, I mentioned that, SDR. And of course, sales manager in the mix, a channel sales manager, a customer success manager. All right, and then we got sales operations manager, solution engineer and sales engineer, renewal specialist, product evangelist, strategic account manager, business development representative, the BDR. So in no real particular order by chat GPT, there's 15 that came out, right? That could be in your sales department and your students could be getting jobs from in different roles here, right? And each one of these has a uniquely different personality profile that, that would work with them. Um, so I guess my point is, I'll go to that. To kind of summarize that idea before we talk about what do you do about it, um, I've come up with this chart. Um, you'll probably find something that looks like it. I know you will if you are to look at our courseware, which is being developed right now. Um, but I made this really for my classes to talk about well, how could we summarize this? If, if I wanted to simplify it a little bit, we could talk about the strategy. And I call it term the specialized sales strategy, the hybrid sales strategy, or the traditional sales strategy. Okay. 
one salesperson, two types of salespeople, multiple types of salespeople. And we can overlay it onto different activities that occur throughout the sales process. And they're all really uniquely different. Okay, so the idea of prospecting is quite a bit different, actually, if you look at the actual effort of sales effort that needs to go into it. What you're doing to just prospect and research and develop a lead to a point of knowing enough to get a meeting is different than what you're doing to move that from an interested client to a closed sale. They're very different motions. One person can do those, they're related, but often maybe, you know, maybe it's better if two are doing it. And then retaining clients like the customer success manager or farmer salesperson can be quite different than growing because growing is almost like a hunting action, but with existing clients. So it's a little bit different. Um, and one nice thing that I've found in talking with students, talking to companies all over, um, this customer success or this retaining role is interesting because it's, it's, um, it's kind of perfect for the, the, um, the, the students you have out there that, you know, I meet them all the time. I, I talk to students and they're just personable and they're outgoing and they really get it. Like they, they pick up on hints and things that are in, and things that are being said in class or in a conversation. And I say, you know, you should, you'd probably do really well in sales. And yet they're really not interested in the idea of closing sales, collecting money, going out and asking for money or some aspect of sales. So they could fit really well into this customer success management role that doesn't do a lot of that, right? It's more of a nurturing kind of coaching and, and teaching kind of role that works on long-term retention. Um, there's a lot of students that are very interested in that, but aren't interested in other aspects of sales. There's many students that aren't interested in that at all and are very interested in other aspects of sales. So it gives us some options is what I found. Um, and you know, my question earlier was, are you teaching this? Now, some of our audience said something else. I don't know exactly what that means. Um, but I do have another poll. I think I'm going to pull that up right now. Pull up the poll. Uh -huh. So let's do another one. Because I'm going to ask you this because if, if um, well, first I'll start with this one. Let's start with this one. Okay, I have a poll, a new poll. My students tend to start in which sales role? Now they start as a full cycle salesperson. They start as a hunter or farmer. They start as a specialized, something in the specialized realm there that isn't a hunter or farmer, right? Um, you know, a lot of companies are hiring BDRs and then trying to maybe advance them if it works out into other sales roles. That's one path. Um, it depends kind of on your sponsor companies too. I mean, all of this is dependent on what your sponsor companies are looking for. Not all smaller companies that may may um, support sales programs are, are doing the more specialized kind of large company way of doing this. So right now we got some full cycle, some hunter, some specialized role. Let me ask another question really quick, and it's my last poll. I don't want to overwhelm us with these. Um, oops, not yet. <laughs> Sorry, the technology is okay. Here's my last question that I'm going to ask right now. Does it make sense to teach more about specialized sales roles as a part of your program? I'm curious what you think about that. Okay, we got some yeses. Um, all right, so preponderance of yes answers there. So that's good. Um, my point here would be some are teaching about something else, some aren't. But, you know, which do you, what, what's the best path forward, right? I've been teaching sales classes. I teach master's level sales classes. But really, the next thing is, how can I prepare my students, right? If I understand that this is happening out there in industry, I can't teach all of that. I can't teach 15 different types of jobs in a sales program, right? Well, what am I going to do? So that's, that's really it. Like, we're in this connected world. And I'm going to interject the idea of ecosystem here. I've just been writing about that for a, a textbook courseware that you'll be seeing in the future. Um, and other projects. But you know, this idea of an ecosystem in a company goes well beyond even these specialized sales roles, right? So it's not just the sales department anymore. It's not just the customer success department, which may fall under sales or not. Um, and these operations and engineering roles and stuff, they highly affect sales. They may or may not be in the control of sales. And there's even more, right? All the information, the, the ability to work with um, other departments within the company is called an ecosystem. Hopefully we're teaching some about that, okay? 
Um, but I don't know that everybody is. And I have recently, uh, with my co-author Noir Chakar, um, reviewed the vast majority of relevant recent um, sales management textbooks and found that some of that is present, some of it isn't. I'm not really knocking competition here. I'm just saying it's not available in everything. The idea of specialized roles beyond hunter and farmer is really not available in many other places, but the idea of an ecosystem and that sales reps go beyond even just their, their role. They sometimes need to be um, connecting lots of different departments across a, a company is something that also needs to be in sales along with this kind of perspective of how sales gets done these days. It's not just somebody out selling, it's something else. So how can I prepare my students? Um, I tried to summarize into five bullets, which is certainly not a many, um, three different classes uh, that I've taught or been involved in or consult with people on or whatever. Most schools are now these days have an intro to sales class, and that may be all you have at your school. And if you do, um, I don't think you have to go super deep into all of this information, to be honest with you, because the true motions of sales really do go back to that full cycle sales. And if you can teach that, you're teaching the other roles too, right? So you're teaching things that happen in these other roles. And if you only have one semester with students about sales, getting very specific probably isn't the best use of time. But you definitely would want to focus on the sales process and the meetings that that relate to the sales process, the different types of meetings. We probably all do that. I think, as Donald was saying, um, human skills and role plays um, are, are still very relevant. Although I don't always know that, like we, I have my students doing full cycle role plays, right? They do a needs analysis. They come back and do a presentation. Um, they're they're trying to land the business, um, and then they they do more advanced ones after that. So I have them doing everything, which is good. It gives them some experience in there, but in reality, they probably won't be doing all of that in their job. But role plays in general are great because our students, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but our students are not comfortable with the uncomfortable in many cases. Um, and we need to help them with that. That's my third point, right? So role plays are a great way to learn process and being purposeful in, in what they're communicating and asking the right kind of questions. Um, I have on here the idea of working in a sales ecosystem. I've done more and more research on this and the idea that it takes a lot more than just sales to uh, sell and manage a customer is, is pretty prevalent in almost everything I'm doing these days. So the idea that there's this, this structure within a company that there's going to be some need to reach out to others, you're going to have to work and collaborate. I think that's pretty important. And that there's performance expectations and job fulfillment can come from sales jobs. I mean, if you're teaching these kind of things in an intro class, you're probably in a good spot, okay? If you get into advanced sales, um, oh, and I wanna back up and say one thing here first. I teach spin selling in my classes. I don't teach it as like it's the greatest tool in the world anymore, um, but I teach it because it's an easy thing to remember. And I teach it because students can go out and they can, um, Google spin selling at any point in their career and they could find the four question types. I really teach strategic purposeful questioning and that's really what I teach and I use spin just because it's a that's a system and there's probably a thousand different acronyms for it but spin is one you could always find anywhere even if the student doesn't remember anything else they can google that later and find it and they'd be not on a bad track right so I don't disagree with Donald that it's probably not the most current thing but it's also one that's pretty well known. So I do tend to teach that. I don't really emphasize it. I just talk more about the questioning and using questions to drive towards a purpose is what they're really doing. Okay, moving on, advanced sales. Um, as you get more into an advanced sales class, I mean, you just continue on these topics, but you get, I think this is where you start talking about these different roles. And maybe not so much about how to do each and really getting into the nitty gritty of each. You've already kind of taught the general idea of what each role does. But talking about that, these, distinct, these distinctions are there in, when, in most companies, that when a student goes to work, um, when, when your students <laughs> goes to work, um, they're going to find that there's different types of people doing sales, right? And they're going to have to work with them. They can't just be salespeople, right? They're, they're going to be handing off sales to CSMs. They're going to be maybe working with account managers. Um, and they're, they're going to be doing a, one piece of this, very likely, in the sales job that they're going to get. Uh, they also should continue to learn human skills and role plays. I don't think I can stress that enough. Our students today, especially after a pandemic, but just in general, in this technology-enabled age, need to learn how to communicate, converse, using all the tools and automation that they possibly can along the way, but also they need to get a lot of practice at that. 
Um, they need to learn how to be effective in the sales ecosystem, which is different than just learning about it, but how to actually manage different relationships across different sales roles, as well as throughout their company. They need to learn now about enablement, automation, technology, things that we've heard from other speakers today. Um, and they need to start understanding that data and analytics is pretty important. They may not be doing the analytics, but using data and understanding and interpreting the results is pretty important in their sales job. And then in sales management, and you start getting more into these strategies. Uh, we're presenting it as these three different strategies in our courseware that'll be out next year. Um, and that, you know, they're related, but, and, and one, they're not all, none is right for all situations, that it depends on what you're trying to do and the roles that go with it. Um, and then managing the sales process is really important to what you should probably be doing at this level and how technology really is what keeps the roles working together, right? And that it's, this technology is more than just helping the manager and to forecast, it's keeping communication interfaces flowing. Uh, we also have role personalities and motivations. Um, and that, as I mentioned earlier, they're very different role types. And <laughs> Sorry, these chat questions are making me chuckle. Yes, I'm from Wisconsin. Um, yay, go Packers. Um, anyways, so managing via sales metrics, but also understanding these role personalities and how you might motivate these different roles very differently. So if you end up being a sales manager at some point, if your students do, they may be working with customer success managers as they go forward. And that's a very different management style than if you're managing a, a, a hunter farm, hunter salesperson versus somebody that's out um, account managing business, right? So there needs to be some an adaptation of management styles. Uh, last couple here, managing via sales metrics. Um, I don't think we can get away from metrics today. We have dashboards and metrics and it's a big part of our life that would come into the advanced sales class too and a little bit into intro sales. And then cre creating a fulfilling and well-being focused workplace. I, I th I'm really becoming a believer in the idea, uh, hopefully you all are too, that sales just talking about the money you can make in sales doesn't really do it. There's so many other things about sales that are good and students really are interested in. Um, and if, if companies are focusing on well-being and fulfilling job situations for, for the generation of salespeople coming out, that we should be teaching about it too, and that that's important to sales managers. So we get into that. Now, how do you get this information? Um, I'll tell you where I've got all this information. I've, I've attended a lot of stuff. Um, over the last many years, I've been fortunate to do a lot of research on these topics and talk to literally hundreds, probably thousands now. I mean, for sure, at least a thousand um, interviews and informal interviews, a lot of structured interviews um, with different sales managers, customer success managers, people doing the frontline role, individual contributors, customers. That's what I do in my research, but it's really affected how I see the world of sales these days. Um, the only one I haven't been to is Dreamforce. I'm going to try and do that one in the near future. Um, I spent a lot of time in customer success, which is the Pulse Conference, and now I've recently gotten back to the Sales 3.0 Conference, and I spoke recently at this AAISP Inside Sales Reps. There's more. There's lots more. These are ones that came to mind. But you can, the reason I put this here is not that everybody can go out and get this information by attending everything in the world, right? But that a lot of these, these uh, for sure, Pulse, um, I looked up Sales 3.0. There is recordings of the conference that just occurred. A lot of them are behind like a firewall. You had to have a paid attendance or something to get them. But a lot of them aren't. Dreamforce has a lot available online. AAISP also has a lot of things. So you could look up these organizations and you could probably find out some pretty interesting stuff on your own without an, a trip and a lot of investment. Um, so you could add some of this stuff just by looking around is what I'm saying here. The other way, and Paul kind of got to this before, I wasn't sure if I should even say it, but of course we got courseware. And I was not asked by Stukin to put this here, but honestly, I did a review of how I got into writing a courseware for Stukin was, I did a review of the professional selling curriculum that they have um, a while ago. And it's one of the first places that I've ever seen the idea of customer success manager in a sales courseware or text. Okay, I've not seen it anywhere else. It is mentioned in, in my other book that I have because um, I wrote that, but I haven't seen it other places. The advanced selling also has a focus on these specialized roles to some extent, and the sales management definitely has one. And I, again, this is a shameless plug, but also not a shameless plug because the reason I'm doing the work for Stukent and working and partnering with Stukent is that these coursewares get updated. We're required as authors to update them every year. Um, we're still building our first one, so we're updating, you know, on this, you know, as we go. But um, I don't see how you can keep current on the things going on in sales without updating every year. I mean, a year is a pretty long time in sales. So 
I appreciate that about Stukin, and I don't want to oversell for Stukin here on a Stukin call, but um, it, it's it's a platform that allows for some us to like get these relevant topics. So some of us that have the good, you know, the position or the good fortune or whatever it is, the 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 research job or whatever, to spend a lot of time learning about this stuff, um, and then we translate that like Donald and and others on the call today, um, April. I was going to try to think April's name. Um, you know, we maybe get out to some more places than, you know, not everybody can go to everything, but we translate that into the courseware, right? Or the things we do. So, you know, Donald and myself and April, we're all willing to try and help you. We maybe can guest speak at once in your class or something, but we're only people that can do so much, but, you know, we put our thoughts into these things and um, hopefully keep them super current for you, right? So that you, you're you getting the, the within a year out, you know, within a year of new in these, in these courseware. So that's what I have. I'm going to go to the Q and A. Um, I think I kept it right exactly on time, 30 minutes time for Q&A. And I hope it's helpful. It's kind of broad coverage of this thing, but the reality is it's everybody has to look at their sponsor companies and what their students need to learn for their particular area and industries that are around them um, and adapt it to fit. So it's not like I can get super do exactly this, but I'm trying to give you some ideas. All right. Brian, that was great. Thank you so much. And I'm glad that you took the time to speak about your courseware that's upcoming. It's so important for you to get that message out. And we're looking forward to our next professional selling event to have your yeah. courseware behind us. Yeah. I made one. So I made one and put yes, it on there, but it's so pretty bland. Yeah, we don't we don't have your cover art finished I'm just yet. Just gonna say roll tight. Get that, yeah, we'll get that done soon. I didn't. So you know, oh, go ahead. a couple of questions that I want to I want to ask you. Um, one of the questions was, do you have anything else other than role plays that you use to help students step outside their comfort zone to help build their confidence? So I do a lot of um, in class stuff. OK, so I do a lot of in class teaching. Well, of course, I do a lot of in-class teaching. A lot of in-class um, little group works. They're very impromptu. Uh, all different things. I use a lot of whiteboarding. Um, I give them quick assignments that they need to find all different ways and modes of reporting back to the class. Just giving them not a lot of time um, and asking them to do something that requires a deliverable pretty quickly and then being able to present that. I just I think that I find that across a semester that if they're being asked to like respond immediately to something they knew they didn't have to that they didn't have to do um and then they get something out of that and they can report on it all within like 20 30 minutes um that's kind of a good skill for salespeople to have right so being able to kind of react quickly and and sound knowledgeable quickly so i, I do a fair amount of that um i think other things i do to help them be comfortable with the uncomfortable um, you know, I just try and have fun in my class. That doesn't really answer the question, but we do a lot of different things. Yesterday I had a listening quiz. If you don't do this, I, I, I would encourage this. This isn't really a great answer to the question, but it's a good little exercise. There's a YouTube. It says it's the, um, barriers to effective listening. The guy's name is Paul Lyon. I, I'm not, I don't even know him. I've never met him. I just found his YouTube five minute long video. I, I wrote 20 questions to go with that and I just have the students watch it and I tell them there's prizes and at the end we're gonna have a 20 question quiz it's like a, a, a trivia kind of thing pay close attention and I just have random questions that relate to it so instead of teaching them about here listen to me talk to you about listening I have them actually listen with some some skin in the game that they might win something some and I give them like little yesterday it was little like plastic medals or whatever it was nothing at the end of it but um they thought it was fun they're master students, they're young, um, but they're learning about the topic of listening by listening because it's important listening and that's what sales is. So you need to listen to the important stuff and try and capture what's important and discard the stuff that isn't. And so I do a lot of stuff like that. I just try and keep them every day doing something different that it's not just, I, I, I never, almost never lecture. I don't like to do that at all. I have them talking. I, I don't encourage them. I require them to be very engaged in the class. Um, and they just, by the end of it, the cool thing is, uh, last thing I'll say on this topic, to not filibuster forever here, is um, I have them do, I, I learned this during COVID, I really liked how they did practicing of role plays, like doing practice role plays. I liked how that happened when we had like breakout rooms and our class was virtual. So 
one of the few things I liked about that. So I kept that. So I have them do four of those now. And that means four days out of the semester, we don't have to meet, which I also like. Um, and they record, they meet as a group, either virtually in different places or together and record it however they want to do it. And um, they, they do like little pieces of a role play and they just record the part that I need, but they work together and they do a, a, a practice role play and they send in the video. But I watch them do that from the beginning ones they do to the last one they do. And they change. They just even adult students. In my online class, I have adult students that do this, and they just change. They get so much better at it, and so much more comfortable over just a short semester. That um, I think just keeping them always in different things, having different things going on, and and just not accepting that they will not engage and requiring them to engage, uh, it, it seems to work. That's great. Um, Ken posted and asked you to share your twenty questions that. You you, oh sure yeah you ask i can precise um, um i don't know if i can do it right here i can i also yeah, i do that's... see here the handouts um i just these are things from the sales education foundation where you're talking about posted things i didn't mention that i just looked and saw it but um just two articles about specialized sales and sales management stuff i wrote for the sales education foundation summary of some of the things i said but i'll be happy to um to get okay. you the my 20 questions and the link to that that video it really works great it's a lot of fun and i just had simple little like prizes I order from Amazon. They're like little trophies and little pen, you know, little gold medals or whatever. Those are great. Um, someone asked if you could go a little deeper into where we can find more information on the sales ecosystem. Okay. Where can you find more information on the sales ecosystem? Well, this really painful answer would be to tell you, not painful, I really like this person, but it kind of comes from a, a research paper that's published in Journal of Marketing in 2018 by Nate Hartman, Heiko Weiland, and um, Steve Vargo, but it's highly academic and, and very challenging to read. Um, I can probably get you, I just wrote a chapter on it, so you'll be able to find it in the, uh, the courseware in the future. Um, that's another little uh, thing I can I can I can find you a better summary of that. Although I think you can just ask Chat GPT, or you could probably Google it and find something decent. But um, the idea of sales ecosystem is the idea that there's there's all these kind of working together components, and that companies and salespeople that are good are finding ways. I use the term friction. Um, the the paper uses the term crossing points, which is rather confusing if you, until you understand it. But um, the idea that salespeople or managers at sometimes want to increase friction to like help make it more difficult for a customer to leave their ecosystem. And at other times they want to decrease friction to make it easier for that customer to stay and to get around and navigate things and get things done within the company, making it kind of this nice cocoon that customers want to stay within. Um, that's kind of the idea of the ecosystem. Of course, it involves all different departments and um, you know, the other, there's a lot of research that fills my head about that, but it, it has to do with, um, you know, different parts of the business team and external business partners and, and all serving the customer with the salesperson. Um, I can find you a better summary of that. Um, and, but it is something that is academically known. I, I don't, and it's somewhat known in the regular sales world, but I will, I will provide to Stu Kent uh, my 20 question quiz and the link and also something on the sales ecosystem yet today. Great. Yeah. And just for everyone attending any of these materials that have been requested and promised throughout the event, we'll be sure to get those to you. Um, well, Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're, it was a great presentation and we're excited to work with you at Stukent and excited for your upcoming course. And I am looking and forward to it too. And I'm glad everybody appreciated it. I, I try very hard to hone my Wisconsin Southern <laughs> Canadian accent. So you definitely, it was noticed. It was noticed. So. <laughs>